first of all uh, a special welcome to mehul cha mehul cha is the uh, founder and ceo of clean core thorium energy a chicago based firm who's been instrumental in putting together this idea this panel and got everything everybody to work on this one welcome mehul bhai the, thank you very much the key participants let me start with elena teplinski she is a graduate from fordham university and georgetown university school of law elena is a leading member of pillsbury's international nuclear projects team and energy industry group deputy leader as a young student she sto- she showed remarkable perception in understanding issues relating to immigration race and social psychology she focuses on international nuclear energy matters including advice to us and global clients on transactional and regulatory issues while she obviously has an impressive resume i'd like to highlight a few that are immediately relevant to the struggles faced by the world as it races towards becoming more sustainable a published insights the european union's in-house science body that determines that nuclear energy is a sustainable technology under the eu's eu's green finance rules the ruling has positive impact for government and private sector support for nuclear technologies in the eu and beyond you know by the way the how this whole conversation started was uh, about 3 or 4 weeks back when we were talking dr kakotkar said you know we used to talk about climate change it became a climate climate emergency now we are talking about a climate crisis so we've got to get started welcome elida glad to have you here with us this evening and the next is mr seth gray is the president and ceo of lightbridge corporation lightbridge corporation is a publicly traded company headquartered in reston virginia an interesting component of his work is advancing state of the art nuclear fuel technology this technology has the potential to transform not just the efficiency and safety but the economics of nuclear power plants this this is an interesting anecdote about him while in law school said gray decided he was going to pro bono represent an actual dissident in the soviet union as part of a final class paper through help from people at the state department and ngos gray identified a man who designed the guidance systems for soviet cruise missiles and nuclear submarines with the support of a major law firm he went to russia and filed a brief on his behalf with other american lawyers that was the first time gray met american and russian nuclear engineers learnt about that field since then he's been working in that field he speaks on economic aspects of using old nuclear power plants and coming smrs the small modular reactors with new fuels and the efficiency and safety aspects as well as the new project dynamics and economics from aspects like nuclear waste disposal and so on gray holds a number of interesting posts including member of the civil nuclear trade advisory committee to the us secretary of state a group on climate nuclear and security affairs of the council on strategic risk and is also a member of the board of directors of the virginia nuclear energy consortium welcome sir gray then we have dr sean mcdowitt an accomplished nuclear engineer professor of nuclear engineering at the texas a&m university and director of the nuclear engineering and science center one of his very early and extremely distinct accomplishments is that while in purdue university as an untenured associate professor of nuclear engineering he began establishing the fuel cycle and materials laboratory fcml which he subsequently moved to texas a&m which has grown in size and stature his multidisciplinary experience in nuclear materials and chemical engineering has equipped him with the flexibility to make research contributions in a diverse range of subjects he earned his phd from purdue university school of nuclear engineering where his research focused on uranium and zirconium alloy nuclear fuel for the integral fast reactor dr mcdavid continues to manage the much upgraded fcml in texas and then the primary mission of the fcml is to study current issues in the nuclear fuel cycle including materials and chemical processing advanced fuels and nuclear materials uh and in 2019 the nsc 
was renamed to the Nuclear Engineering and Science Center and now comprises a couple of reactors there and nuclear science research laboratories and the Nuclear Power Institute for Workforce Development. Welcome, Dr. McDermott, a very accomplished professor indeed. And uh, finally, the chairperson for this evening, Dr. Anil Kakotkar. This, is some, this introduction is something that I always enjoy making. When the president, George W. Bush, Bush visited, in, visited India in 2006, Dr. Kakotkar was introduced to him. President Bush asked him, so you are the Kakotkar. Are you happy? This is, this is, he was, I, just, just imagine the amount of trouble Anil Kakotkar has given during the civil nuclear discussions of the deal signing. Finally, the president of United States, none other than him, wanted to make sure that Kakotkar was happy. Welcome, Dr. Kakotkar. Uh, I don't need to read your bio data. No. All of you know you. Thank you very much. And the only point that I want to make is that you're consumed by your current passion to get to the third stage of the three-stage nuclear energy journey outlined by Dr. Homi Baba several, several years back. Thorium-based nuclear energy that is proliferation resistant and less hazardous nuclear waste is a key part of Dr. Kakotka's work. Thank you once again for joining us this evening and morning for all of you. Over to you, Dr. Kakotka. Well, thank you, Mr. Lakshmanarana. And uh, uh, Thanks to everybody who is uh, in this conference and my special gratitude to our colleagues on the panel. Uh, together, I think, uh, let us attempt to create a perspective uh, to address uh, the theme that we have for this uh, conversation today. Is nuclear energy a solution for sustainable development? Uh, Mr. Shah, can, uh, can you share my slide from there? Yes, sir. Yeah, please. So uh, I have just, uh, I think, uh, five or six uh, slides. And uh, I have deliberately chosen this one as an introductory slide. This actually is a picture of Kaiga Atomic Power Station. And you can see the four 220 megawatt HWRs uh, operating there. Uh, it is, uh, well, they started at different points of time, but uh, roughly around a decade uh, uh, of continuous operation uh, has, been, has been there. Their units are working extremely well at plus 90% capacity, capacity factor. And in fact, in uh, 2016, unit one, made a world record of uninterrupted run of 962 days. So, well, the point that I want to convey with this title slide is that we are talking about answering this question before us. Uh, for the emerging economy countries, uh, leveraging PHWRs, which are a very successful uh, successful technology now in power program of course will uh, uh, it has moved on uh, while uh, there are uh, 11 more such 220 megawatt units in operation in india uh, there are uh, other two uh, 540 megawatt uh, phwr units operating at tarapur and also there are as many as 16 700 megawatt units under construction the first one of which has been connected to the grid and is undergoing trials right now so there is a, uh, a fleet mode of construction of these phwrs underway in india we are going to also add the, the power program by additional reactors in the form of fast builder reactors and also reactors constructed through cooperation with other countries and VVR reactors, uh, in fact, uh, two are operating at uh, Kudankula and four more are under construction there. What we are discussing today is uh, a somewhat 
to a bigger problem. We are not talking about India specifically. We are talking about a global problem and uh, how to address the, the issue of such. Can I go to the next slide? Yes, sir. So how to address this issue of sustainability in the context of uh, climate crisis, which is already here. And if you want to address that issue, uh, of course, there are countries which are very advanced uh, and they're already operating nuclear power program. Uh, but most of them, there are exceptions, but most of them are the the so-called advanced countries or many of them are actually OECD countries. The map of the world in the top right-hand corner, if you see, the there are four, uh, that is uh, four shades of blue uh, and then the rest of the uh, world is, is all green. Those blue shaded countries are really countries with high human development index. Uh, between uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, 0 0.95. So these are the countries where per capita electricity consumption also is very high. Now, of course, you want to reduce uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere or the global warming. There is a question of decarbonizing that. And so... Uh, there is a question of adding more nuclear, more renewable in place <clears throat> of existing uh, uh, electricity plants or other energy plants which are based on fossil fuel. But if you look at the, the bar chart uh, at the bottom right hand of this figure, you would notice that OECD countries, which actually represented by the, the dark blue band, uh, this growing... Total energy is growing, but it is very slow, more or less stable. So while there is this challenge of decarbonizing, but uh, if you see the rest of the world, the non-OECD block as it were, uh, there you would see the demands are higher, uh, the, uh, and there is a much higher growth uh, going forward up to the middle of uh, the century. And, and so there is the dual challenge of decarbonizing existing uh, energy systems, but also adding uh, more uh, kind of uh, clean sources of energy. And world is doing quite well in terms of, uh, in terms of adding solar and wind, uh, and of course, uh, a few other uh, renewable energy options. But... Uh, most of them or majority of them, the big chunk of that is actually variable energy sources, variable energy generating sources. And you can't run grids like that. You must have a stabilizing factor and mostly derived from baseload uh, generating source. Otherwise, of course, you have to worry about the storage and other electronic modes of control which adds to quite a bit of cost. So the point is, uh, the challenge is in the emerging economy countries. And there, if you want to do, then we must have clean energy systems. And on that, we must have baseload generating system, which actually means nuclear, which are fit, which are which meet the requirements of those countries. If, if you want to really address this question that is before us. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, please. Next one, please. Yeah. Now, uh, this is uh, what I want to focus really. This actually, the information is from an MIT study, the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world, which was published in in 2018. What is this? Now, uh, yes. oh, you know, on the left hand, and bring my, just bring my the there, are, there is data. Uh, yeah, just bring about, my protein uh, share. Average generation not cost in, in a region in United States and also in a region in China. And you would notice that if you, uh, you know, when uh, 
if you talk about the current levels of uh, the emissions carbon dioxide emissions then uh, whether depend you know whether your mix has nuclear or no nuclear it doesn't make much difference but if you start moving towards low carbon or zero carbon for that matter if you see in, uh, in the uh, that new england chart uh, the the extreme uh, right hand side uh, block the orange block, bar, bar there is uh, the the situation when there is no electricity no i think we can remain on the previous slide uh, and you would notice that without nuclear the tariff to the users and this is average tariff including system costs it can become two times or in chinese case it can become even four times and this is something which is not appreciated because people are looking at the current situation or a marginal change and you don't see that factor but if we don't correct and in, bring in nuclear right now going forward we may have to invest two large amounts of money and this is what has happened in in germany for that matter uh, but that's a that's a separate story and uh, for the optimum tariff the level of electricity coming from nuclear uh, it could be as high as 60% or 80% so and i think we need such studies in india i have not seen a single study of this kind and unless we have such reliable studies it may be quite tough for us can we go to the next slide next one please so it is in this context that uh, i personally very strongly feel that we must bring in nuclear and overcome the challenges that are there for nuclear nuclear has challenges proliferation is a challenge safety is a challenge waste management is a challenge uh, many countries small countries suddenly taking on a large reactor uh, they see a fair bit of uh, financial risk that is a challenge and there are lots of new designs you know because requirements at different parts of the world are different but the question is uh, uh, for a emerging economy country they would want a proven system which has been already running uh, well uh, in in host country or where some other countries and they won't want to be the guinea pigs now i think the best fit for all this in my mind is a 200 megawatt pressurized heavy water reactor fueled by thorium and of course enriched by high assay low enriched uranium now phw are are proven reactors a lot of experience around the world these are the smallest commercially operating units but they compete with even large units despite the challenge of economy of scale simply because they are made in india and we make things much cheaper particularly high tech things in india and uh, well it's happened in space it happened in atomic energy it happened in many other tech sectors and of course thorium gives a lot of properties which enhance safety which enhance its performance and uh, of course there is uh, phwr has a lot of uh, cold moderator in the right in the reactor core that also contributes to contributes to safety the fuel burn up because of thorium goes up so the spent fuel becomes just one eighth and the uh, capital cost of these reactors as i said you know is it low but operating cost also there is benefit and uh, so uh, the uh, i have been arguing for some years now that uh, heavy water reactors filled with thorium halu combination are really the best choice next slide please next slide yeah now uh, this uh, on the right hand side there is some data to say that in fact thorium uh, shows some benefit in all all thermal uh, thermal reactors but the benefit is best in uh, phwrs and particularly if you see the the bottom uh, right hand corner figure the red bars which actually talks about the plutonium generated and you would notice that 
fact, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the plutonium uh, generated, it becomes negligibly small with thorium fuel because there is deep burning of, of plutonium to produce more energy. And, and whatever is left is uh, very heavy on even isotopes. So it is a completely proliferation resistant. Now, uh, Mr. Mehul Shah, who is there in the audience, uh, uh, in fact, he has been a thorium enthusiast for more than a decade, uh, or maybe more than that now. And uh, he picked up uh, this thought, and uh, his company, CCTE, has developed this Anil Fuel, Advanced Nuclear Energy for Enriched Life, that can work with to heavy water reactors, both PHWRs as well as PANDU, with little change to the reactor itself. And so his company is collaborating uh, with Texas A&M uh, University and Professor McDevitt is here with us to tell us in fuel manufacture development uh, with uh, the Idaho National Laboratory. Uh, for the irradiation and post irradiation examination. And they are also working with a few more universities, particularly MIT, on, on fuel modeling. The uh, ATR, which is at Idaho National Lab, is a reactor with uh, very strong powers. It can do whatever we can do in India in just one tenth the time. And so it can deliver fuel qualification through irradiation much, much faster. And that strength, and of course, we're talking about the high assay, low enriched uranium, uh, and the United States is rightly placed for being the fuel supplier for that. So I think it's a win-win situation if you address the challenges of third or the emerging economic countries to provide the clean baseload uh, energy solutions through this anil field 220 megawatt heavy water reactor or even other heavy water reactors and that is what uh, we are going to talk more about it uh, in a conversational mode before i move to my next panelist uh, i would request uh, mr mehul shah to tell us exactly what is happening in just two minutes about uh, this development, and then uh, we will move on to Ms. El Elena Limpis. Most, most certainly, Dr. Kagodkar, thank you. And first of all, I thank CIC for this opportunity, and I thank the panelists for being part of this discussion. And most importantly, we are grateful to Dr. Kagodkar for his mentorship, and we are committed to be part of his vision and the mission in fight against climate crisis. Uh, let me share some uh, current state of play at CCTE as we are thrilled with the progress with our innovation. Uh, Anil Fuel is designed to deliver cost effective clean baseload energy in very short term. At the same time, it will address the key barriers of nuclear like proliferation, waste management and safety. And uh, like Dr. Kakotkar explained, currently our fuel is being manufactured at Texas A&M followed by first of its kind irradiation testing and qualification at Idaho National Lab. In collaboration with MIT and INL, CCT is developing uh, extension to the US Department of Energy's Bison code, which will eventually validate anil fuel and the future fuel of thorium-based uh, advanced fuel. Uh, patent for anil fuel is, being, uh, is filed with US patent and trademark offices as we speak. And we are establishing a supply chain uh, for the commercial production of anil fuel. We are in conversations with fuel fabricators in US and Canada. We have uh, signed MOU with US-based Santros Energy for the supply of HALO and exploring several sources, including India, for the supply of thorium for anil fuel. Uh, and in, in short term, CCT plans to deploy anil fuel in existing refurbished CANDU reactors. And in longer term, we plan to deploy anil fueled Indian or Canadian heavy water reactors for emerging and established countries for clean, safe baseload energy. So we are very excited that industry is now recognizing the benefits of anil fuel. 
Now CCD is building partnerships with like-minded investors and the stakeholders. We are in dialogues with reactor supply out of India and Canada, utilities in Canada and Romania for refurbished reactors, and dialogues with emerging countries for new reactors. And I really appreciate and thank you for uh, hearing our state of play. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach us at cleancore.energy. Thank you. Back to Dr. Thank Kuhn. you, Mr. Shah. And uh, may I now invite Ms. Elena Teplinski to make her remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Kakurkar, for moderating this discussion. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be in the same panel with you. Um, thank you very much for, uh, to Mr. Sh Mr. Shai uh, for inviting me and as well as to CCI uh, for hosting this discussion. Um, so um, I have had the pleasure uh, to advise uh, governments, uh, vendors, owner operators in the nuclear industry for more than 15 years. And I'm a part of a group at Pillsbury that's been doing this uh, for more than 60 years. Um, so as, as part of our experience, we've really seen the evolution of the nuclear industry. And we've also seen, uh, you know, some of the challenges that the industry has faced. I'm going to share a slide um, just so that you can get a bit of a visual of, you know, how we see the world today when it comes to uh, the expansion, the potential expansion of nuclear power. Um, I could share many slides with you that demonstrate that uh, we unfortunately are not on the trajectory to meet uh, climate change mitigation goals. Uh, unfortunately, despite uh, the very large scale rollout of renewables over the past decade, and in fact, the renewables have become much cheaper, um, we are still burning um, as much uh, fossil fuel as we were uh, about 15 years ago. Um, and Increasingly in the past 15 years, uh, you know, there has been a, a focus um, on whether nuclear technology can present uh, a solution to the climate challenge. Um, if you look at about 15 years ago, this map uh, was probably not as big as far as countries considering nuclear, but it was, it was big enough. Um, there were quite a few countries looking at nuclear because it presented a base load reliable source and the technology was well proven. Um, a lot of countries had experience building nuclear. So there was what we called at the time the nuclear renaissance, uh, where a lot of countries started considering and building new nuclear power plants. Um, while some countries were you know, successful in doing so, you look at China, for example, that is you know, on, on its way to potentially you know, overtake the United States um, in the next decade or so as the, you know, the number one uh, nuclear reactor operator because they're building reactors so fast. You know, India has had great trajectory in building large reactors. Uh, we've seen newcomer countries, for example, like the UAE, uh, construct these large reactors on time and on budget. Uh, but the thing is that, uh, you know, very few countries have the capacity, uh, both their governments and their private industry, to undertake these very large and complex projects. We're talking about gigawatt scale projects um, where the financing is mostly available from government sources. Um, so that means that smaller countries, uh, as well as uh, you know, private players, simply just do not have the capital outlays uh, or the financing available to undertake these projects. Um, you also have uh, you know, a lot of countries that have smaller grids. Um, that are looking for uh, to nuclear energy for other purposes, such as desalination. And increasingly, there was a, there was a very important discussion that started in the past year or two uh, about the use of nuclear energy to produce hydrogen, uh, which is a way to not only uh, resolve some of the issues with energy storage, uh, for example, from renewables in the electricity sector, but it's also a way to decarbonize some of the very difficult uh, sectors industrial sectors uh, such as transportation, including marine shipping, um, you know, iron ore production, cement production, and, and others. So increasingly, nuclear technologies are being sought as, uh, as a decarbonization solution you know, beyond just electricity and beyond the typical markets. Um, and what you look at, if you can look at this map, what is in green, uh, these are countries that have uh, existing nuclear power plants um, and they are also considering small, small modular reactors. And, and why is that? Uh, you know, for some of these countries, even if they actually have, you know, the, the funding to deploy large reactors, 
uh, they are looking at small reactors for lots of different solutions and also for a, being able to locate uh, and site nuclear reactors closer to population centers, use them for non-electricity uses, as well as involve some of the private players. If you look at the countries that are in yellow, these are generally newcomer countries. And uh, with the exception of a country like Australia, um, most of these countries you know, simply do not have the financing available to construct large reactors. Um, many of them are looking at small reactors, but you know, financing can even be a challenge for these. Uh, and these are countries that are generally fast growing. Um, they have a demand for electricity. They have a demand for heat. Um, they are looking at nuclear as a technology um, that can provide a sustainable solution. So small reactors, small modular reactors uh, can be a solution for these countries because it meets the grid requirements. Uh, they also uh, you know, are less uh, capital intensive um, and they can be an interesting option. Um, so that's, that's the map today. I will, I will leave it at that. There's uh, much more discussion to be had about the opportunities and challenges, um, and I'll be happy to make comments further on. Well, thank you. Uh, that was uh, very interesting and very useful. Uh, maybe uh, we can start getting into a conversation right now, and of course we'll come back again for a group conversation and then uh, a discussion with the audience. But uh, if I can request you to little bit reflect on the, uh, you know, we're talking about this emerging economy countries or countries in yellow in your map, except of course, Australia. Now, uh, would you uh, like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the sort of security, political, legal dimension of nuclear power? establishment in those in those countries and in that context uh, what do you think of the proliferation resistance feature uh, what role it could play if you have any views on that absolutely uh, you know nuclear security is a big consideration especially as you're looking at regions that don't necessarily have um, you know the, the type of security that that one would have, would expect uh, for a new nuclear power plant, and sometimes it takes people by surprise to see some of these countries that do have major security issues considering nuclear. But they are considering nuclear because there are very few other choices they have, uh, you know, to provide a sustainable development solution. Um, you know, these countries. It's it, it's worthy of noting that many of these countries do have research reactors nuclear research reactors. So they have some experience, but of course, the security issues associated with a research reactor are not as significant um, as those associated with, uh, with a larger um, nuclear power plant, even if it is an SMR. Um, and most certainly the non-proliferation community um, needs to be on board in order to support uh, the development uh, and the deployment of these reactors in these, in these new countries. So non-proliferation is going to be a key question. Um, and any country that, uh, newcomer country that uh, you know, decides to pursue nuclear for the first time beyond a research reactor is going to have to demonstrate to the international community, to the IAEA, uh, to vendors as well, um, that, uh, you know, that you can meet these, uh, these nuclear security challenges, you know, in part by choosing technologies that offer really good non-proliferation resistance. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to raise this one more uh, sort of point uh, in a similar vein. Uh, you know, traditionally, the light water reactors are fueled by low enriched uranium. Now, uh, of late, there is this discussion on uh, the high SALEU being uh, a significant driver of the, uh, of the fuel uh, for nuclear energy generation. And I think I noticed there is some policy evolution taking place in the United States with respect to the HALU supply chain. And, and of course, companies are gearing themselves. So, uh, it will be interesting to hear from you, your perspective, uh, a legal who can understand the nuclear politics uh, as to 
uh, this transition of course it's not going to replace but this kind of new emergence of helu as a fuel for power generation uh, would you like to comment absolutely so you know in the united states uh, you have about 50 to 60 companies that are pre- that are developing uh, new reactor designs whether there are uh, existing light water reactor designs uh, you know that are now smaller more modular or advanced reactor designs and i would say the majority of them are actually advanced reactor designs uh, and most of these designs are relying on helu um and there's an increasing understanding you know the US government has invested um you know provided uh research and development funds to many of these companies licensing support to many of these companies they're looking to these companies to be exporters to uh, you know to the international market as well as drivers of nuclear growth in the United States but there's currently no uh you know helu domestic supply outside of what the national labs can potentially provide uh and helu currently is only available from uh, from china and from russia uh which of course are competitors of the united states um so the us government has understood this message the industry has made it you know very loud and clear we need domestic helu supply um and for that reason the us government has provide, provided significant funding to companies such as centris energy uh to develop these homegrown uh helu production capabilities and um you know there are also uh, some legal and regulatory issues around helu for example you know transportation you need special types of casks um you know there are existing regulations that more or less address it but uh the regulations are sort of being streamlined the nrc is providing additional guidance um you know there's there's understanding that you know even though the fuel comes after the reactors are you know are close to uh uh you know finishing construction we can't wait <laughs> we can we can wait to you know to construct uh you know 70% concept construct the reactor realize we have no fuel to fuel it um so because of that you know helu uh production is uh you know is one of the one of the number one priorities for uh you know for uh, several uh nuclear energy bills that have been passed in congress um and it has huge support from the US government thank you ms selina uh we'll come back to other discussion also later on in our uh, general conversation so if i can now move to professor magdavid and invite him to make his remarks professor magdavid well good evening um uh from where i'm sitting it's Good morning but uh I'd like to start by thanking CIC for inviting me to be here and to Dr. Kakodar to uh, uh moderate this panel discussion and uh, just start with a few uh, remarks uh, I I visited India in 2007 I went to IIT in Kanpur and I visited the Chennai um the Indira Gandhi Center in, in Chennai and uh at that time I had been um completing work on a thorium based fuel concept while I start that I started while I worked at Argonne National Laboratory and so in a sense I've been working with thorium based fuels for uh, more than 20 years and I've been a nuclear engineer and working with nuclear fuels for more than 30 years and one of the things I often tell my students is every fuel selection has a context and that's something to back up and look at the idea of nuclear sustainability as a whole <clears throat> I've worked on metallic fuel for fast reactors, molten salt fuel for for the, the, the new or old molten salt reactor concepts and uh silicide nitride fuels for advan- uh, accident tolerant fuel concepts. And so there's different reasons why you would pick a fuel and it has to do with um the objectives you're after with the particular topic that's one of the things we're talking about mostly today which is this uh uh a neo fuel which is a helu uh uranium based uh and also thorium heavily thorium based fuel that fits into the PHWR that's the context and it provides a uh some interesting game changers with respect to um how the that fuel could be applied around the world and a couple of other concepts on sustainability which is one of the other words in the title of this con- uh, conversation um back as a young engineer um you know i entered nuclear engineering with enthusiasm but a lot of it had more to do with a youthful um 
optimism and, and just the, the cool factor of what the science was that I was looking at. Very quickly, it doesn't take long when you get into nuclear engineering training to understand that the physics and the basics lean toward a scientific version of sustainability that you can see very clearly. But there's a social political aspect that you don't know in school when you come to uh, implementation of these technologies. And so a lot of times when you get into things that on paper, you very quickly go to waste management and uh, nuclear security and all these things that you can say, these are the benefits, but the implementation and the application of these benefits take a social will that is, um, is part of the, uh, the challenge that is beyond the scientist and the engineer, but it takes a group like you have assembled here to see the context and the perspective. And so as we look to a sustainable nuclear future, it's got to be a piece of the puzzle with solar, with wind, with anything else. It's not the only thing, but it is a emissions-free nuclear technology. So it has a lot of benefits like you already highlighted. So let me um, go ahead and take my five minutes and focus on where we're at. It's been mentioned already, but where, what we're doing with this anneal fuel concept because um, I, I could talk an awful lot about all the other fuels I work with even now, but I think it's best to, to stay focused and, and, uh, and take a look at this concept. Uh, this idea that uh, this, um, CCTE has created, I got involved with, uh, it's almost two years ago now, it's close to you know, one, one to two years ago, working with Idaho National Laboratory and uh, some colleagues of mine were talking with uh, uh, CCTE about doing an irradiation test and they involved my laboratory, which was mentioned earlier, the thing, the fuel cycle materials laboratory. We have a hands-on laboratory. You can even see some of our researchers making the anneal pellets. The concept that we're after is that there's going to be an irradiation test that begins later this year, uh, according to the current schedule. And the concept of the anneal fuel is to have this thorium uranium oxide mix that has high enriched um, uranium that will allow it to burn for a longer period. Um, and then the uh, thorium mix and this central annular hole. And so in our lab, we've taken the concept sketch on the left and moved to making pellets on the right. And you can see that we've been successful in starting this and we're starting to already prepare them and uh, under the, the Idaho National Laboratory QA program, we're going to be sending those to Idaho in the May timeframe of this year. And this picture on the lower left comes from Idaho as they're preparing this experiment to go into the advanced test reactor. We're going, looking to uh, build 12 rodlets of these pellets of various compositions and various uh, geometries to go in and then be pulled out at different burn-up levels with a maximum of a pretty high burn-up of 70 gigawatt days per ton. And um, just to highlight that that's um, the nature of the project that we're working on. And um, there's a lot more I could say, but I also think it might be best to wait for questions and see, see where, what direction you'd like this to go in because nuclear fuel, while it's a niche technology area, it has so many variations that you can make a, a concept design change, like instead of doing something like um, this uh, PHWR implementation, you would be doing something like a high temperature reactor for hydrogen production. That's two different things, two different fuels. But in this particular case, one point I would like to make that I forgot to say, the various design, reactor design programs that are being spun up or resurrected to address certain design application problems. Um, if you're starting from the perspective of designing a new reactor, you are looking at a, a very long lead time. People say 20 to 30, maybe 40 years to get a reactor designed, qualified, regulated, and built. Um, whereas this particular anneal concept, the PHWR is already a design in existence. It's being marketed around the world. And this fuel is being designed to fit right into it to where assuming things are successful, it would be able to uh, be implemented less than a decade. And I believe the aggressive time frame is less than five years from now. So it's, it's a near-term solution that is actually in hand. 
or on, on the way to be coming in hand. So that, those are my opening remarks, and I'll, I'll pause and, and we can talk about this more as we go. Thank you, Professor McDavid. And uh, no, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, one has to look at uh, the fuel and the reactor as a combination uh, for everything in terms of reactor performance, even in terms of the safety behavior and so on and so forth. And we all know that the materials do play a very important role. For example, uh, the, uh, the steam cycle efficiency is directly dependent on the temperature, the structural materials, the fuel cladding, uh, how high we can go. Uh, same thing about the fuel, for example, between the melting point and the operating point, how much margin you hold, and so on. These are some very broad, simple things, but there are more details to, to worry about. And I, I personally believe that uh, uh, what uh, is being attempted through Anil fuel in, uh, uh, in PHWR is to, in fact, in fact improve the, that combination, fuel reactor combination, from natural uranium heavy water reactor to this. It cuts down the total fuel consumption it allows uh, somewhat greater safety margin, for example, because thorium thermophysical properties are better uh, in terms of conductivity and all, but in terms of melting point, melting point is much higher. So you do end up getting higher higher margins. And we'll, we don't have time to go through these details, but there is that, and there are many other, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Seth Gray is going to talk about the light bridge fuel which also essentially attempts to do similar thing in context of PWRs. So, uh, uh, but uh, would you have any additional philosophical thoughts as it were in terms of uh, this fuel reactor combination and the, the role materials play in that? Well, eventually you have to move from a paper de design to build something. And then beyond that, it actually has to function. And so the materials are a key element of that. And I've spent my career trying to bridge the gap between a nuclear engineer and a, a material scientist and, a material sci and, and the nuclear waste uh, discussions. I've worked in that as well. Having somebody who can speak all of the trade languages across the different disciplines and try to be a connective fiber is a little rare because uh, a reactor designer will say, well, we'll design this reactor. It works perfect on paper, and the material scientists can change, the, can figure out how to make it work, or the, the chemical engineers can figure out how to make it work. But it, it needs to be a cross-disciplined um, activity, but it's not all science. It's also regulatory. And then it's also, uh, like I said, social political. And um, you can have the best solution that can never be built or you can have something that can function. It's very similar to some of the technology competitions we've seen through my life, Mac PC, or uh, um, uh, some of the video technologies you've seen. The most elegant technology doesn't always win the market. And so it's really more a matter of what functions, what works, what's cheap, what's economical, what has the best benefits, and what do you invest in and actually commit to? Because one of the biggest problems we have is an attention deficit disorder to these design concepts where something becomes new and improved for about five to 10 years, and then we abandon it for the next new and improved. And so it takes a commitment to excellence and a commitment to delivery that's uh, as much part of this problem as the tech science and technology. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask one more question, if you permit, and that is, uh, the challenges with thorium in terms of fuel fabrication. Uh, the thorium is known to be a very stable material, chemically inert material, and a lot of advantages uh, get derived out of those properties. Yes. But the same thing becomes a challenge when it comes to fabrication. And uh, would you like to comment something on that? It, it certainly is unique when you get to thorium. And, it, and to be a little scientific for the crowd at the moment, it is uh, in the chemical valence structure, it only has one 
uh, valence state of interest to where it doesn't have the ability to move its electronic configuration uh, up and down the uh, stability um, ladder. As you say, like uranium and plutonium both have multiple valence states of existence. That gives you processing options for chemical separations, for sintering, for the various behavior at different temperatures. You're stuck with THO2 and just THO2. There's not a lot of stoichiometry variations. That challenges your, your processing to where um, when you get good at it, you've got a product that is also very stable for disposal. So it's, it's one of those things where it has its cons in processing and its benefits in, in, in waste management. And in accident scenarios, you have a water incursion to thorium, you're gonna have uh, a slower reaction rates and things like that in an accident scenario. Not that we wanna talk about accidents in, ever, but you need to consider those things when you're designing fuel. So when you get to this concept of a mixed thorium uranium, you actually gain some benefits of the uranium back into processing. So in a sense, all it really means is in the processing, you've got to do different pressures for the powders, different temperatures for the sintering to get it to a nice high density. And once you've got that final product, you've got the benefits of thorium there. And one of the properties that hasn't been mentioned but is very important for thorium and that's also sought in these other things is its thermal conductivity minimizes things like fuel swelling, fuel uh, migration, fuel restructuring during operation. It makes it a much stronger viable fuel uh, as far as fuel performance issues goes. So that's maybe a little bit of a rambling answer to your question, but those are my first thoughts to what you said. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Professor McDavid. And uh, shall we now move on to the uh, next panelist, uh, Mr. Seth Gray, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Lightbridge. Uh, so, Mr. Gray, may I invite you to make your presentation? Well, thank you, Dr. Kakatkar, and it's an honor to be with you today and to have been invited by CIC to participate. Uh, Lightbridge is designing a new fuel for water-cooled reactors. Our principal focus is on light water reactors, particularly pressurized water reactors, although the fuel variants could also be applicable to pressurized heavy water reactors. When we were starting out, we also started a business we thought should exist in the world, which was advising countries that never had nuclear power reactors how to obtain them and do so very responsibly. And we ended up writing the strategic plan for nuclear power for the United Arab Emirates and have worked in many other countries doing that. And then launched our nuclear fuel development effort that's led us to work with many excellent people, including Sean McDevitt and Elena Toplinski, and uh, you know, who've helped us very much in this, in this development. Uh, presently, we have uh, two funding mechanisms from the U.S. Department of Energy called gain vouchers, one to work at Idaho National Laboratory and one to work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the United States. And, and while we began the project with a focus on design for large pressurized water reactors, we, we've been shifting recently to also have a focus on the small modular reactors, the the SMRs. And in particular, uh, what we're designing is a metallic fuel, a uranium zirconium metallic fuel, very different fuel than what has been used in these reactors previously, not pellets, not tubes, an extruded metallic rod uh, that, that we developed. We've also developed the manufacturing method. And with the small modular reactors, there are four points in particular that are leading us to, to bring them into focus now. Um, one is that this new fuel could give a pressurized water reactor a 30% power increase. And for a newly designed small modular reactor, that is quite feasible to design and deploy uh, the reactor around the fuel to benefit from the 30% power uprate. Uh, which lowers the levelized cost of electricity, the cost per unit of electricity sold. And one of the main points of these SMRs is to ha have a lower cost of electricity to compete with other methods of generating power. A, a second reason is ramp rate. 
the ability of the fuel to go from zero power to full power very quickly and back down or move up and down to load follow with renewables on the grid as the sun shines, as the wind blows, and we think that small modular reactors with our fuel can, can operate on the grid with, with renewables very well. Uh, a third is safety issues and pressure drop issues that we think are very significant with this fuel to translate into economic savings, including what could be an emergency planning zone only to the site boundary of the plant, reducing emergency response costs, uh, not needing nuclear grade backup diesel generators and, and other safety uh, measures that translate into economic measures. Um, and the fourth is the, the non-proliferation, the increased proliferation resistance. The large pressurized water reactors are very expensive. And that's one reason they've been limited in number and to a small number of countries, making them much easier to safeguard those plants. Uh, as we move to much less expensive small modular reactors that can be produced in factories or shipyards and then shipped to sites, uh, we could have thousands of them in over a hundred countries and the non-proliferation aspects become even more important. And we think the non-proliferation aspects of what Lightbridge is doing will be, will be very important uh, to, to SMRs. Um, another reason is that our focus at the company, a focus in today's event on this panel also, is nuclear technology to, to help prevent catastrophic climate change. And there simply won't be enough new large PWRs built to make that much of a difference globally for climate change before 2050. We have 29 years to meet the IPCC goals of staying below two degrees of warming. And by Lightbridge's calculations, the number of large reactors of equivalent new clean energy the world will need between now and 2050 is more than 20,000 large reactors of clean energy equivalent. Now, not, not all of that will be provided by nuclear power. Some will be renewable, some will be other sources. But if a quarter of it is nuclear, that's over 5,000 large reactors equivalent uh, nobody, not even China, Russia, is talking about even a very small fraction of that number of large reactors being built, maybe a couple hundred. So to meet climate goals with nuclear, we need very large numbers, thousands and thousands of, of smaller reactors. And that, that's where Lightbridge's uh, focus is going more. Dr. Kakodkar had um, mentioned the promise of next generation reactors and the other speakers have, have mentioned them and we at Lightbridge certainly support their development as well. Uh, however, in a world where designing, licensing, deploying a whole new kind of reactor takes so long and needing thousands of reactors to matter for, for climate goals, I think it's much more likely that we will meet climate goals with current reactor technology improved a bit in the current reactor technology for light water reactors, for pressurized heavy water reactors, and also with advanced fuels, like what Lightbridge is doing, what Mayhill Shaw's company is doing for new fuels for existing types of reactors, are much more likely to have thousands of new reactors deployed in 29 years than whole new kinds of reactors although we'd like to see them start to, to, to develop and move ahead faster as well. Um, and and I'll, 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 I'll end with one more point relating to uh, clean core thorium energy and what our friend uh, Mayhil Mayhil Shah is leading there uh, on combining you know, thorium from India with HALU from the United States in an Indian smaller reactor design, a 220 megawatt uh, PHWR, which is that many of us were involved in various ways on the U.S. and India nuclear deals, leading to membership in the nuclear suppliers group, um, leading to the 
one, two, three agreement for civil nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and India. And, and I think that's been an underutilized benefit and agreement. I wish we could have seen more cooperation coming from an agreement that officially is called a, an, an agreement for civil nuclear cooperation. And I think what clean core thorium energy is doing could become a real a, a real way to have that kind of U.S.-India cooperation in reactors that could be produced in India with fuel technology and supply from the United States as an export product, uh, particularly to developing countries that, that will need smaller reactors. And, and I'll end with that and I'll look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, indeed, uh, what you... Uh, mentioned about the the climate uh, challenge or now the right thing to call is a climate crisis uh, is uh, is very much here and uh, uh, as i had said in my thing you also mentioned in your presentation the uh, you know without nuclear being a, a significant part uh, of this solution to address the climate crisis. I, in fact, do not see any way. And in that also, as you correctly observed, we have to find solution on the basis of existing immediately deployable reactors because uh, 29 years is not too long if we have to reach uh, the net carbon zero by 2050, which is the IPCC goal. And and so uh, I think this is both a big challenge and also I think a big opportunity, and uh, and we must rise uh, rise to that. And so I see a lot of synergy between CCT and Lightbridge in terms of the uh, what shall I say principal approach. The detailed approach are obviously different, but principal approach. And uh, I do hope that this cooperation. Uh, would take us uh, much further uh, towards uh, towards our goal. Uh, well, I think uh, with this, uh, uh, now it's time for us to get into the discussion among the, the panelists. So this is a chance for members of the panel, if they have questions to raise to other colleagues and also to me, uh, if anybody would like to take a lead, you can have... Uh, maybe five, 10 minutes conversation in that mode, and then we can open it up to the larger audience. So would anybody want to take a lead uh, from among the pan three panelists? Um, I, can, I can start, Dr. Vipurko, with a yeah. question. So um, I, uh, for the past decade, I've had a chance to travel to India uh, probably about a dozen times and have spent you know time with uh, the various companies in India and organizations involved in the civil nuclear sector uh, and have been really impressed by the capabilities um, that India has in, in designing and uh, developing, constructing and operating reactors. And I've often asked the question, uh, why does India not have an export strategy uh, for its nuclear industry? Uh, so many other countries that have less experience um, in you know, these, these areas of nuclear um, uh, development and construction have been exporting, but India has not done that. And I'm, I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts and, and how that can be turned around. Well, uh, I'm very happy and very glad that you asked that question. That is something uh, which has been uh, bothering me for uh, not just this decade after I retired from atomic energy, but even before. I know many countries, they build their first reactor and before they build their second reactor, they already exported two or three reactors. Now, one of the reason is, uh, you know, uh, we, are, we were actually operating in a, uh, a very different kind of political constraints. We had our own policy. And, and so uh, uh, arriving at the international civil nuclear cooperation itself was a, was a major challenge. And uh, so one could not have thought of that before because even if we wanted to, uh, it's not clear how the, the world markets would have, would have received this. So this opportunity has really opened up after establishment 
of the civil nuclear cooperation now then of course so we lost some time because of the liability issue uh, but leave that that's not the subject matter of today's thing and now uh, uh, government of course as i mentioned in the, in my uh, presentation uh, has given approval for construction of reactors in a fleet mode now government as i said there are 17 700 megawatt phws under construction out of that the first six approvals have come uh, in pairs two by two but the last 10 have been approved in a single shot one paper to approve construction of 10 700 megawatt reactors to be constructed in fleet mode so now the establishment is all gearing up to come up to that challenge and uh, and so uh, uh, and then of course uh, the uh, export uh, effort uh, is also a significant effort and uh, so in this uh, very heavy load that has come suddenly uh, there is this issue whether they should do now or later uh, but uh, i am sure if there is opportunity uh, in terms of export possibility if there is uh, Uh, in the sense, on part of uh, the department or nuclear power corporation, with lesser effort, the, uh, we can have a higher export opportunity. I'm sure they will look at it. But that has been that uh, kind of you know to be or not to be kind of problem. Uh, you are right uh, there, but I hope it will change. Great, thank Anyone you for else? that. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask any question? I'm not sure if we call this a question as much as I want to re-emphasize something that that Seth said a little bit. Um, but the the magnitude of energy requirements to get from here to uh, climate sustainability, to get from here to lifting the quality of life around the world in some of these emerging company countries that need this the magnitude is so huge that um and not just to focus on CCTE or Lightbridge but both of those companies should have plenty of space to fill hundreds of reactors and still not satisfy the need and so the there's a lot of need here as a and, and including other energy sources like wind and solar and whatever so it's it's a very large unmet market in a sense that it, or emerging market is maybe a better way to say it and i think that's not that's not something to underemphasize or to to let pass without pausing and just re- recognizing the awesomeness of the scale that we're trying to to meet there um and another comment that i wanted to make is that the phwr there's a lot of discussion around the world about small modular reactors and the phwr is an existing small modular reactor according to many of the characteristics um i'm not sh- i'm not deeply in that field to know if there's some reasons why you wouldn't call it an smr but it's on the right energy scale the uh, the picture that you showed at the very beginning of that energy park with four small phwrs together is the very definition of how an smr would be implemented and so there's a sense where it's it's there and it's ready to go and and some of these other advanced water reactors like uh like Seth highlighted where their fuel is targeted those are near term ready to go reactors or already existing reactors and so the things that we're going to be able to do in the next 30 years are things that are in our hands now whereas these advanced reactors like molten salts and advanced SMRs and things like that still have to get the first one built. And so that's I think a very important comment to to to, to drop right now is that that's part of this landscape we're, we're living in. Yeah, I think very true, very true. And uh, I somehow feel often uh, uh, you know first of all uh, nuclear itself seems to be a bad word in fact somebody had described as a nuclear in allergy allergy we all suffer from nuclear allergy and i don't see without nuclear how this uh, gigantic problem can be solved you can't reach uh, 
net zero. I, I looked at some reports. The investments required to reach net zero purely on renewable energy, which most of it is variable. Uh, in fact, as far as India is concerned, it would require investments comparable to to India's GDP itself. Mm-hmm. And how can we afford that? Even if you know one way to get capital, but people have to pay. And uh, you can avoid uh, maybe uh, maybe half or even larger part of that investment by resorting to nuclear. And but it's a question of how to get over this uh, this allergy. And to me, I think these debates will always go on. What is really required is to show performance. Once people see performance, they will actually want it. Right now, what is happening is uh, nuclear energy, in spite of the fact that it supplies uh, uh, a very large part, at one stage it was some 16, 17%, 18%. Now it is 10, 11%. Uh, so it has, you know, there's a huge experience, but uh, there is also Chernobyl, there is also Fukushima. And, uh, and people don't uh, get very much convinced about this rational arguments about safety. The trauma seems to be working uh, much more uh, heavily. And, and so it looks to me that the answer is performance. And that is where it's important. Performance in terms of deployment, performance in terms of safety, performance in terms of cost. And that is the answer to really uh, getting the final answer to the question with which we started uh, this uh, this meeting. So I think uh, probably it's time now to open uh, uh, this whole session for questions from the audience. And uh, may I now turn it back to Mr. Lakshmi Narayana to... Uh, sort of moderate the uh, the audience questions. Sure. Let me let me uh, take a, a stab at it with uh, Vanita. Before that, I think Seth Gray wanted to say something. He put up his hand. So would you like to go? Oh, Seth? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm just, sorry. Please go ahead. Well, I'll just say very briefly that the small modular reactor program in the United States began before Fukushima and before the fall in natural gas prices. And with Fukushima, it creates obviously a much greater focus on safety, but also new regulations that add to costs related to safety. And the fall in natural gas prices creates economic competition. And I think that the best way to address both of these issues is new fuels combined with those reactors that address safety and economic uh, benefits, which is, which is what we're doing. I'll also say that I think another change in the world is that we've gone from something of a pyramid of looking how uh, electricity is provided on the grid, where the bottom 40% of the pyramid approximately is baseload power, like coal and nuclear, then intermediate power, like, like natural gas or hydro, and they may be peaking power, like, like oil burning plants. And instead, now we've just had so many renewables put on the grid that provide more power than needed at certain times of day and no power at some times of day, that what we need is not the pyramid, but something that can balance with renewables with zero carbon emissions. And I think only nuclear can do that. And in large numbers, small modular reactors. And that's the future grid that will succeed or not. And hopefully we will get there um, to, to, to win on climate. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, There's some Edmalai yeah. Ponnuswami. If somebody can unmute his line, he had a question. He's currently working in one of the nuclear plants here in uh, India. Uh, in the meantime, as he participates, there was a question that came up in the chat box about the molten salt reactor, the traveling wave reactor, and the existing ones. Compare contrast is the question, is broadly what the question is. I think you've already done it saying one is existing, the others are all new, even the first plant is there. But if there is something that you would like to add to that answer, that will be helpful. Uh, yeah, I can do that. But uh, Professor McDavid, you want to take a, take that question? 
Or Mr. Seth Gray? Could you repeat the question again? I was looking at the questions, the list of questions, and I, I, I didn't hear what was said. Sorry. It is a, a kind of a compare and contrast. Molten salt reactor, traveling wave reactor, PHWR, can do. I guess the interesting thing for me is I've worked on all of them. And um, there have been the different times in my career where I've, been, I've become associated with a reactor concept. And I thought, well, this one's crazy. And then I get involved in it. And I say, well, this is really good. This is really good. And I really like it. I'm not talking about any of the ones you just mentioned, just so you know. Uh, but with the, the molten salt reactor, we ran an experiment in the 60s. We've got concepts, and there's a number of companies that are pushing them forward. But there's a, there's a long pathway before that becomes possible. It, 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 it answers a few problems. It addresses some problems with respect to fuel performance and other different things like that, makes some really good solutions possible. It brings new problems to the table, such as corrosion of the vessel. And how do you operate when the fuel is always moving through the entire plant? There's different regulatory issues. The regulators don't know how to regulate the molten salt reactor yet. So it's got a long way to go. Uh, traveling wave reactor um, actually is built on some solid technology and it, it has some future possibilities. Again, it's another private company that um, they're working hard to push it forward and some variations and everything has a context. Everything has a pathway to success. And if you look at the, the business models for some of these reactors that are 20, 30 years out, molten salts, I don't know how long before we'll have a commercial molten salt reactor um, you know, if I'm pessimistic, I'd say 30, 40 years. If I'm optimistic, I'd say 20, um, something like that. And, um, and I'm, who says I'm right about anything? And that, <laughs> these things are, are in somebody else's hands. And so I'm just an observer and a participant in my lab. We, we were making fly molten salt for a particular concept that might be built in the next five years. We, and we've worked with nitrides and metals. I've worked with the traveling wave reactor and the fuel performance and the fuel fabrication of that. So all of these are on a path that gets them to a goal later. But as I've noticed over the last 30 years, you make a, you make a 25 year plan and you have to change it every year because of what happened in the next, next year. So there's a lot of ground to cover before some of these become close to being realized in construction as opposed to taking something that's already has a has a reactor with a fuel slot and you qualify the fuel to fit into that reactor that's a much more near-term solution i think great thank but you doesn't mean i won't work on these things i find them all fascinating and i like them all uh vanita is uh elumalai pondaswami's line open uh let me just check with you He's, uh, he's, he's given in the chat box. He's an electrical engineer and energy auditor from Chennai, presently at Pickering, Canada, where an atomic station is decommissioned. So he's requested saying, please permit me to ask a few questions. As this line is opened, I just want to read out the next question. Uh, maybe Seth can take this. If nuclear submarines are kosher, can we use that model to set up 1,000 locations, 220 megawatts? Can we use global delivery model with an on-site in India, offshore and global grid, et cetera, et cetera? You know, any ideas on, you know, these nuclear submarines, uh, aircraft carriers that are powered by nuclear plants, can they be used? Well, well, well clearly the navies that have reactors powering ships, aircraft carriers and submarines have small reactors. These do not have very large reactors powering the ships. So the world has many decades of experience of powering many hundreds of ships with small reactors that operate very safely. And many of those designs on the ships are similar in some ways to, to the reactors on the land, smaller versions. Some are pressurized water reactors, some are boiling water reactors, some are other designs. And many of these small modular reactors that are coming are, are similar. So New Scale is a pressurized water reactor. GE Hitachi's BWRX 300 is a boiling water reactor. Now, now they're not the same as on submarines, but, but similar technology. And so I think we know that small modular reactors can be produced, they can be operated safely. 
Now the question is, can they be made in ways that can be built and operated cheaply? If you look at aircraft carriers and submarines, those reactors are very expensive. So technologically, yes, but now there's innovation involved on fuel and on how we build the reactors, including at shipyards, factories, shipped to the site, and, and, and ways to hold down costs. And, I, and I'm optimistic on that from what I've seen. Okay. Thank you. And this Elimalai coming on, he has been Juanita. No, it looks like, I would like uh, to add one, uh, Mr. Narayanan, with your permission. Earlier, somebody asked a question about the molten salt reactor in compared to heavy water reactor. Yeah. And I think uh, heavy water uses the solid state fuel, whereas molten salt uses fuel in a molten state to begin with, which doesn't exist today. And secondly, there is a reprocessing that is involved in molten salt reactor at some stage. And that's where the concern rises with the if you were to use thorium, uh, the reprocessing for thorium has not been established in the industry yet. Whereas using fuel like anil fuel in a uh, pressurized heavy water reactor, we have eliminated reprocessing completely out of it. So that's why it makes it heavy water reactors much more desirable to deploy in short term. I just wanted to add that. That's good. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I think Erimalai Konaswamy is online. He can probably... Yeah. Hello. Please go ahead, everybody. Yeah. Uh, good morning to all of you. I am from Canada, Pickering, uh, just three or uh, to five kilometers away from the decommissioned Pickering Atomic Power Station. So as an engineer and energy auditor, I am aware that uh, nuclear energy has got an unparalleled advantage with respect to the fuel, fuel, uh, fossil fuel generation. My question is in two parts. One is, safety is uh, discussed in uh, length. Second is the project cost and the operational cost, life cycle cost is conspicuously underplayed. So what is uh, the hesitation on the part of the uh, insurance companies to have insurance with the uh, atomic power station uh, victims if some eventuality happens? That is one part of it. Secondly, uh, this America, which consumes more than 20% of the global energy consumption, uh, um, which has the natural resources, finance, technology, and everything, is not improving on their energy mix on atomic energy. And thirdly, with respect to India, see, we have got a very uh, bitter experience of handling the victims of Bhopal gas tragedy. Our government is more concerned about the corporates of multinational uh, companies and not for the people. That was the past experience. So it has got a two components. One is the safety. Second is our preparedness and the empathy of the governments to meet any eventuality to compensate the victims. Thank you. Already in Canada, 82% of the energy mix is non-fossil fuel. That is carbon zero. Only 18% is with fossil fuel. So why can't we think of reducing the consumption, the demand, um, and uh, to the extent that we can uh, acquire the uh, renewable energy? Thank you. And then also uh, doing some uh, low-hanging fruits like uh, converting the um, uh, transport to uh, electrical vehicles. Thank then you opting so for it. For me. Yeah. Thank you. I Thank think you. we have other participants yeah. waiting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, could I uh, this yeah, is, I'll uh, I'll do that. But uh, uh, Ms. Teplinski, uh, would you like to tip, address the uh, insurance part to begin with, and then I'll come back on this. Sure, but uh, I I was having a little bit of trouble with sound uh, in in making out the question. What is the question about insurance? See, if uh, you just say it is so safe. Why should not uh, the insurance companies come forward to ensure to make any compensation for the victims in case of any eventuality? Yeah. Um, okay. I understand. Thank, thanks for thanks for repeating the question. So there is a, a global nuclear liability insurance scheme that was designed. Um, you know, it's been it's been in play for the past 40, 50 years, and and the idea behind the way that the insurance scheme is designed is that 
it, it makes most sense uh, instead of having to insure every single party in the supply chain and an operation of nuclear power plant to insure only one party. Um, and that is the party that owns and operates the plant. Um, so, you know, insurance companies, as uh, many people on this, uh, on this uh, webinar know, you know, n- nuclear is very specific, it's very technical. Um, you know, insurance companies do not want to simply insure nuclear without understanding uh, all of the issues involved. Um, so for that reason, there have been specific nuclear insurance schemes created to support nuclear operation. And there is worldwide insurance available um, that, uh, you know, that supports um, nuclear operators um, and is issued to nuclear operators. And in the case of a nuclear incident in most regimes outside of the United States, um, liability is channeled to the operator, which means that the operator's insurance um, then comes into play and the operator's insurance covers um, all liability, all victims, all third parties. Uh, in the United States, we don't have the legal channeling. We, it's actually by insurance. So anyone can be liable, but the insurance covers um, anyone's liability under the process. So there is uh, you know, billions of dollars of insurance available in the world. Each country has its own nuclear insurance pool. So the, the insurers do, in fact, insure nuclear. It's just that they do it in a most efficient way. Well, on, the, uh, on this aspect of uh, why can't we uh, live a... Uh, Kind of, you know, why can't we reduce our consumption? Why do we want so much of energy? Now, uh, this is true that uh, correlation between energy consumption and quality of life or human development index, uh, there is a correlation and there is a big scatter. So there are obviously many other factors uh, which are at work. But the fact is, uh, I read uh, somewhere a very nice description and that is while in principle uh, reducing consumption and uh, kind of uh, living an austere life uh, is a right philosophy uh, some people will uh, pursue for some time it's doubtful whether some people will pursue for all time and whether all people will pursue for even some time this is a civilizational issue and uh, uh, I think it is uh, in the sense uh, if there is something happening in some part of the world and if everybody knows that uh, uh, there is uh, energy at the uh, kind of root of you know addressing this better quality of life, uh, obviously other countries would want. You can of course change the, uh, the pattern, the elasticity and maybe earlier we require much more energy for a given uh, HDI. Maybe late today uh, uh, the devices have become efficient. The, uh, the intensity, energy intensity has come down. So all that is important. But I think uh, the need for energy cannot be wished away in my, in my view. Now... Uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, example of Kerala was was given, and uh, this is very nice that this is happening. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, we have to think about an interdependent uh, nation or interdependent society, and uh, whether you import energy, whether you produce energy, whether you import energy, or whether you import goods. Uh, effect is the same, it's somewhere else the energy gets consumed. So on the whole, if you take the average, I think you cannot escape that conclusion. And I have, uh, I have all Gandhian philosophy in, in some detail. I have been close, my family has been close to Gandhian way of life. But I have come to the conclusion that I'm not a champion of living in an extravagant way at all. Nothing of that sort. But I think there is something civilizational that dimension we cannot ignore. Thank you. Sir, how do you, how do you compare the 40% increase in per capita consumption of the United States with respect to Europe? Well, I, see, I told you that there is that uh, scatter and we 
are Which not one do you have a benchmark? You no, know, for example, for example, no, no, I'm coming to that. For example, for India to reach HDI comparable to United States, we have to increase our energy consumption by a factor of five or six to reach that HDI. To match US, probably we have to increase by a factor much bigger than that. Now, surely there is a 40% scatter, 60% scatter in this. But um, I think we should not lose the big picture for want of these uh, comparisons. That's the way I look at it. Thank you, Kakadkar. I think we have uh, approached the closing time. I just want to yeah, see no, if uh, each, you, you, each, you, 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 each one of you would like to make a 30 second final comment, please, and then we can close the session. Thank you. Maybe we can start with uh, Elena and conclude with Kakadkar. Sure, sure. Happy to start. So I think it's, uh, you know, everything has been summarized quite well here. There is uh, you know, a huge opportunity uh, for nuclear energy to be a key driver of deep decarbonization, which is, which is early, urgently needed because of the climate crisis that we're in um, and the increase of that climate crisis that we're facing. Um, there, there needs to be a way to address uh, the, the large scale deployment uh, of reactors. Um, using existing technology uh, fueled with new types of fuel is, is one uh, key way to address this. Uh, the other issue is bringing down the costs. Um, and certainly the idea that India, which has you know, 40 years of experience with small reactors, could, could export uh, reactors to developing nations at low cost, you know, seems to be, you know, to me, uh, you know, is, a, is a very interesting option and I think needs to be explored further. Thank you, Seth, or Dr. McDovitt. I'll, I'll, I'll start, thank you. Um, the, the question uh, we are addressing today is, is nuclear energy a solution for sustainable development? And, and I think the answer we've arrived at is yes, that substantial growth in nuclear energy is a necessary component of the growth in energy in the world and replacing current non-sustainable energy and without substantial growth in nuclear power, the world will not meet its, its climate goals. And as Alina said, I think this has to be with existing reactor technology with new fuels. And I think that if we're going to have such an expansion of nuclear power so quickly, that is the only way to do it realistically. <clears throat> so I, I, don't, I won't make real long comments, but I would just uh, share the thought that with all the different big picture complexities that have been brought up from population to quality of life to climate change, those are all really large. And this discussion we're having, the sustainability of nuclear is a part of that answer to, to the challenges of the world. And as I alluded to earlier, the reason I got, in, got excited about the field that I work in and continue to work in is my optimism to uh, work on something that actually makes an impact around the world and makes a difference. And this is a, a direction where a new nuclear fuel concept is not just a cool toy in my laboratory, but it is something that has a reach to, uh, to change um, society. I mean, I, I don't want to sound too uh, pie in the sky there, but it, it really has that potential to be that level of impact to the world. And so that's something I'm very optimistic about. Thank you. Karji. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I think we had uh, an excellent conversation and uh, I really feel, as I said in the beginning, that uh, I think we are approaching the crisis point and the, uh, the climate crisis, uh, in fact, it's going to, its impact on the world is going to be far, far higher than what we have seen in the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, and we obviously cannot 
to wait and uh, you know see that happening because all this preparation takes time and this 30 years is uh, really not too long in that context and and so uh, i think we need to uh, sort of get our act together and uh, in india you know any thing high tech uh, because the cost of living is much lower compared to advanced countries uh, at the same time we have uh, uh, very competent uh, youth young human resource uh, we end up doing high tech work at a much lower cost typically half and that's behind why these phwrs are cheaper uh well if we make pwrs tomorrow that also will you'll find the same same answers so in fact i have been telling my colleagues from westinghouse and edf that you you manufacture your pwrs 100% in india and you will become competitive which is not the case that's exactly mm-hmm. the point and mm-hmm. to me this is a great opportunity between india and united states to take reactors from india take fuel from united states and address the energy problem of the new world where there is you know uh, there is an issue of decarbonization but there is also an issue of new energy supply and all by clean energy source and uh, <clears throat> base load nuclear energy has to be necessarily a significant part of that so i think it's a win win opportunity uh, only thing is uh, we must all work together to address this otherwise the destiny will not forgive us thank you thank you very much thank you very much all the panelists it was a very interesting conversation lots of insights uh, clear direction this is this is not a debate it is a unified voice talking about the future thank you on behalf of cic i extend my gratitude to all of you for participating in this very interesting session thank you thank you and thanks all panelists once thank again you. thank you um thank you dr kapoorkar mehucha and all the panelists um and the audience who turned up today coming up next on 23rd of april is the uh, principal economic advisor sanjeev sanyal is going to be here in chennai hopefully uh, you know we can still pull it off and uh, you know the covid cases are spiking um but we hope we can you know somehow pull it off let's let's see he's going to speak about policy making um for an unconventional world um so we will have the mailers sent to you all and look forward to another exciting event thank you very much <laughs>